Turning up for this one because the weather hasn't been too brilliant. Hopefully, the subject matter is of sufficient interest. So, it's 30 years ago since the New Age Woodstock, since the harmonic convergence, and uh, a number of reasons for wanting to give my own particular take on it at this moment in time. Jose is one of my, my great inspirations, no doubt about it, I absolutely love the guy, but what you are not going to get tonight is some great involved exposition of the mysteries of his version of the mind cat, and there's plenty of people doing that. The information on all that is readily accessible. Uh, we've got Joe right here in the audience here who, who's putting it out big time. I'm attempting to convey something else tonight. Now in my Avalonian Eon I discussed how I gradually uh, came to become aware of his ideas on the mind calendar and how I kind of got sucked into the vortex along with a whole bunch of other things that really led me to feel that there was a profound reality in all of this and in my attempted follow up, I say attempted because it's 300 pages in and I've been going back and forth for about five years, I've gone into a lot more detail. I've gone into a kind of ongoing uh, biography of it. And in this, I'm profoundly indebted to the work of Stephanie South. Now, when an older guy leaves his wife of many years for a good looking woman who's decades younger than him, there is normally a little bit of an ick factor involved. There's no question about that. But fair play to Stephanie South. Uh, her work expounding the whole life of Jose is exemplary. I simply would not have been able to construct this lecture without the first of, the, of these two words, the 2012 biography of a time traveller, which takes us up so far, up to the harmonic convergence and beyond, and then when things get really, really involved, and I'm not going to go too much into this, the second work uh, covers all of that. Cosmic Trigger, one and two. Number two really sets the kind of mood for what I'm doing tonight. Number one is a book I'm sure many of you will all know. It's full of the most extraordinary mind-mashing material and it leads into its own 2012 conclusion, which is Terence McKenna's version of 2012. But the interesting thing, you know, that's my most read book ever. That is the most significant influence on me. But I really love volume two. And over the years, over about 25, 26 years now, I've probably read it half a dozen times. And the Down to Earth is where Robert Antle Wilson talks about the importance of what you might call your landing coordinates. In other words, the kind of influences that were formative for him in his, in his young days. And this stretches as far to, you know, as a young child going to see the movie of King Kong in 1933 or then going to see The Wizard of Oz in 1939, all of these things were formative and what's going on, what, what the quality of life and culture is in the America of the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, the war, the atomic era, the intellectual ferment and so on, all of this it's important to understand the full context of the 60s and the ultimate psychedelic voyage. And I've always been a history freak, and in my, my Crowley book, I start off by saying that you know, I was born in 1959, so I came to consciousness in the 60s, and my parents had been involved in the Second World War. They were part of this enormous great thing that had only been 20 years earlier, and it was like two completely different realities. And I absorbed a whole bunch of stuff during, this, during that, that first 10 years of my life. The, you, can't, uh, you, know, you can't overestimate the importance of, 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 of the mix of influences. I, I can just about remember seeing the very first episode of Doctor Who in, in 1963. I can remember Beatlemania. I, I remember 
get in a sense of the emerging world in 1968 when, when I was nine. You know, I remember because Martin Luther King was killed on the 4th of April and my birthday's on the 5th of April. I remember on my ninth birthday in the morning playing with a little car, dinky toy or whatever on the carpet. But on the radio I was hearing that this guy Martin Luther King had been killed. And I remember Mexico Olympics, the Black Power Salute. I remember Grosvenor Square and the demonstration stroke riot and how um, the golden shot on Sunday afternoon with Bob Munkhouse was postponed in order to actually <laughs> live coverage of the Grosvenor Square riot. These things, they're all part of what goes into your head. So, Jose, you know, what I'm going to talk about tonight is the formative influences because I feel that all of these influences, whether you are drawn into the intricacies of the vision of the mind calendar or not, the nature of these formative influences are the story uh, of the formation of the new age and the nature of, of Glastonbury and a whole bunch of things in the modern world regardless. And they also, when you see how they work, through the emerging consciousness of a great artist and a great visionary of shaman, you also, I hope, take inspiration that the whole of our form of influences can maybe be our raw, our chemical material. So I was born in 1939, which is a pretty powerful year to be born, for starters. And when he's 14 years old, he goes to visit, and you're going to get some dodgy Mexican place name pronunciations from me, okay? I just hope that's the word. Teotihuacan, at the age of 14, <laughs> and the Pyramid of the Sun. Uh, this is quite an interesting little version of what the place might have looked like in its prime. And he's up there, and it's a sunny day, and he suddenly gets a very strange sense of timelessness. You know, the, the voices of the people around him, the things that are going on around him as they're just talking and moving around are on a different kind of level of time. And he feels this kind of sense of light arising. And whatever this feeling is, he's sure that somehow or another the people that built this place that lived in a high culture that existed here had some kind of knowledge and understanding of that and, and that that feeling, that space was part of the key. You know, and this set him off and a few years later he first kind of came across uh, the Mayan script, the Mayan symbols and, and found it compelling. You know, as somebody with an artistic temperament found that there was something about the form of it that was really, really interesting to him. So he comes to his, his, you know, his mid-teenage years, at the time of birth and rock and roll, at the time of the emergence of the beat generation, you know, his, his Ginsburg and Kerouac in their prime. He's at college and he's, he's going out to nightclubs and, and listening to, uh, you know, Blues man, he's meeting John Lee Hooker, he's reading Jean Paul Sartre and Camus and all this kind of thing. He's soaking up the whole vibe of the time, the beat generation, and so on. And this is the start of an academic journey that, that serves him very well because he's able to become uh, an art historian. He's ultimately able to become a PhD as an art historian and teach at universities. And this gives him a tremendous amount of slack, especially in the 60s, to pretty much do whatever the hell he wanted, you know, which, is, which is great. So fast forward to 1963, and here's the legendary Martin Luther King, Civil Rights, Washington, I have a dream moment. And there, in the huge great crowd, is Jose. And there's no question that, you know, there was a quite extraordinary level of power, emotion, energy, intensity, inspiration in this event. Uh, it was something that had a tremendous knock on effect on society at the time. And somewhere in the back of Jose's consciousness is that sense that these enormous 
unified uh, events have a tremendous potency and that they are, you know, something to strive for. Now, it's been following his inspiration, you know, for 10 years since he's, he's first gone to the ancient sites. But in 1964, um, this is a place, Zoki we'll call it, well, that's what I'm going to call it now, a place where the historical Quetzalcoatl is supposed to have, have hung out. And as so I goes there, and he then goes on to Acapulco, and he's called paratyphoid fever, uh, and he nearly dies. And, and this is, is actually the start of a sequence of these kind of experiences for him. Throughout his life, he, he has death and rebirth experiences. He has pretty damn physically heavy stuff happen to him. And while he's got this fever, he's in a delirium. And he sees visions of, of Mayan culture, and he sees a particular male and female who, who try to heal him in some way, that do a ceremonial dance, the charm, and he has this vision of himself returning from the jungle with a treasure of some kind. Now this is, is absolutely classic shamanic near-death stuff. This you could see quite clearly as the seed of, of what is to come, you know, over 20 years later. So as part of the whole excellent deal of being a, a in the academic scene, he gets a travelling scholarship to Paris, you know, in 1967, and a lot of people uh, does a whole shed load of acid. And on one occasion, he's, he's coming down and he's trying to read a book about the Tibetan adept saint, Miller Reaper, uh, one of the most famous, probably actually the most famous of all the Tibetan saints, and he comes to feel that in the way that you do when you're coming down off a huge great trip of acid and thinking about something like this, that maybe he was Miller Reaper in a past life, it primes him. It primes him to look for a Tibetan teacher um, from that point on. And he starts, you know, he's painting during 67. And he, he feels that he's seeing with what he called Venusian perception and he's aware of the fact that this is, is the uh, planet associated with Quetzalcoatl, the main Mesoamerican deity and he starts just sort of putting these weird mind symbols into the paintings that he's doing and just staring at them and, he, and at one point he feels that he's sitting in a, in, in a circle with a group of Mayans who are projecting this thought form into a crystal ball that is then being projected into his own brain. And then an Australian Aboriginal character turns up and hangs around as an interplane combat. It's 1967, man, you know, he's <laughs> got all this. And he starts as part of his artistic work, he takes records these spontaneous conversations where he's kind of gibbering in funny languages and funny words and just coming up with all this spontaneous stuff. And Somewhere in the midst of this, he starts to, he's pondering very deeply about the nature of modern art and culture. And, you know, I mentioned uh, he'd been reading Sartre and Camus. Uh, these alienated guys are, are not providing soul food for, you know, the coming generation. And just around right about that period of time, you know, Colin Wilson is, is creating a new existentialism. So, from the perspective of Jose, who is really now tuned into what is art, what's, what's it all about, what purpose does it serve, how will it serve society, how will it, it fulfill uh, the needs of this, this new generation, he conceives a literary project, it's never, never finished, but he calls it Art at the Dawn of a New Magic, and Stephanie South you know, quotes a little bit of this, uh, what it was all about, he envisions a great race of artists, psychedelic magicians arising throughout the planet, transforming reality through the power of their arts and the evocation of their minds. Through conscious artistic creations, they will tap the potential of human spirit, change the way people perceive themselves, and ultimately inaugurate the dawn 
of a new magic where the collective vision would change reality. So again, this is 1967, so this in many respects is already happening uh, on the world, the political scene. Here's Abby Kaufman, founder of, of the Yippies. Somebody is looking at the whole situation in Vietnam, protesting Vietnam, and you try to look at the new ways of doing this. And, and there's an interesting document also that Allen Ginsberg had drawn up, bringing in a, a, a kind of air of absurdism, of surrealism, into uh, political protest meetings, which is, is very uh, intriguing. And part of the whole um, zeitgeist as well, the band of Fugs. Now, I think I'll, I'll slightly jump ahead with the, with the album recorded in my hand. I think that was 1968. But there's a famous track on there with a quote which is kind of by a Plato, if you like, when the mode of the music changes, the rules of the city shake. And this is really uh, what 67 is all about. And a plan is conceived, an amazing anti-Vietnam protest is conceived that is going to basically, um, in October 1967, they're going to uh, surround the Pentagon and perform a ritual of exorcism to expel the demons of war <laughs> from the Pentagon. And it, it, I don't know where well, you can see that, but it, it, there's a whole plan there, you know, out demons out, back to darkness, you servants of Satan, out demons out. Uh, and there's a whole list of deities right across the whole spectrum, right across the whole world culture. Uh, and, and the idea is, is set in motion. And First of all, about 100,000 people gathered and, and went as far as, as the Lincoln Monument. And from that basic group, about 30,000 went all the way to the Pentagon. And you've got an absolutely astounding mix of people. Yeah, you've got Abby Hoffman, you've got the folks. You've got, on the one hand, um, a real hard ass literary figure like Norman Mailer. You've also got the occultist filmmaker Kenneth Anger. Mm -hmm. And in the midst of all this, you've also got Jose, he's at all. And you've got some iconic stuff. This, this is right up against the Pentagon. You, I don't know, people seem to have a short-term memory problem with this kind of thing. We've seen a lot of this stuff more recently in America. This is where you know the iconic stuff came from. This, this is a 17-year-old girl um, famously standing right in front of all these guys that are not that much older than her, a lot of them, uh, with fixed bayonets. And the famous images of, of people putting flowers in the guns and so on. This sort of derives from that period. And here's Ed Sarvis, this is actually uh, at the moment of the ceremonies, screaming out all, all this stuff. Uh, and it's interesting, prayer for the soldiers and their violent karma in Vietnam. Uh, but a whole bunch of, of stuff, and, and yeah, they do. Uh, there is some film footage of it, and uh, here and there on YouTube, I think you can actually hear recordings of, of, of Ed Sardis and the folks doing all of this. There is this massive power of demons out. So it's, 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 it's a whole new mode of functioning, you know. It's, it's, it's kind of a magic ritual, it's also surrealism. It's also what I used to call a happening, and it's also politics, and it's all a, a way of attempting to undermine, to transcend um, the set patterns of power and authority, to somehow make them on a level of the game that they're, they're unable to respond to. And, and I think there's a lot you know, to look at in that now, in terms of the way everything is in America, and all the kinds of issues that are rising. This is where we get to with 67. By 68, uh, it's turned to street fighting man and revolution, and it's all, you know, it's degenerated. The Democratic Party convention uh, turns into a, a massive great punch up when the police wade into demonstrators and so forth. But at this stage, what you clearly got is, is a template that somebody like Jose is not going to, you're not going to forget if you've been part of something like that, you're going to remember it. 
and, and if you're somebody that's been sitting around communing with minds and been projecting stuff into crystal balls it's then been beamed into your head while you think the news and thoughts after you've had your paratyphoid shamanic near death experience then all of this is going to go to the blender and it's going to come out somewhere isn't it you know so in 1968, this is Salvador Dali, in 1968 with Brigitte Bardot, um, and it's interesting that, that oh, well, he's, he's, he's in New York, and as part of what he was doing, he, he created a happening, what they used to call a happening, outside the Museum of Modern Art in New York, a, a bit of straight performance that was linking through to Dada and Surrealism, he had a whole bunch of people all with their bodies painted in masks and waving banners about and dancing through the streets and felt an incredible satisfaction when Salvador Dali himself actually wrote something in the New York Times about this praising this. This is a hallucinogenic Toreador which is also from 1968. I'm reminded of Dali's famous quote, I do not take drugs, I am drugs. <laughs> but it, it connects us up to a set of influences because Dada and surrealism and the idea of all the happening is working its way all the way through the 60s. Uh, and and it's, not, it's not hidden really, but it's something that might be, um, again, we forget about. Uh, and it's one of these things. One of, one of the kind of themes that I'm running with is that the words that we use to actually describe certain things make a lot of difference to the way in which people respond to those words. If you talk about a magical ceremony or a mystical ceremony, or if you talk about a piece of performance art, you will get a very different kind of response out of people, but you can quite easily be talking about exactly same thing. So he's obviously got to head west and he ends up in <coughs> out places like Solon. It's summer of 69. We've got a pretty powerful month or so. We've got whatever happened here. I mean, I certainly believed in the moon landing when I was 10. I'm watching on the TV at about six o'clock in the morning. Whatever the hell happened, uh, it mutated the old consciousness of the world. You know, it blew people's minds. Big time. And, and there's the little matter of, of Woodstock. You know, mm -hmm. we think that the Pilgrim Festival sometimes gets a bit on the large side, but you know, there's there's the template for large right there. Jose was married at the time, and he had a son called Joshua who was born in July, just before the moon landing, just before Woodstock. So if you think about what everything was like then, uh, the sense of extraordinary expansion possibilities, limitless possibilities that there were then. So, just take a note of those dates, August the 15th, 16th and 17th, you know, that was the epic three days of Woodstock. And sure enough, you know, things kind of walked out and went a little bit downhill and it was, you know, only a matter of months later that we get all on and the whole thing seems to go um, a little bit problematical. But there we are. The people that took it, uh, got that far with it, what they felt they weren't going to forget in Ari, and it's not like they would have ceased to feel that what they believed about it was, was not important. And it's just a couple of weeks after this, the Jose makes Tony Shearer. Now Tony Shearer, really needs um, to be bigged up in terms of his importance. Without Tony Shearer and no harmonic convergence uh, and Jose's entire sense of the, of, of the Mesoamerican canon system would have been very, very different. Very interesting guy, Tony. He's, he, he had um, Lakota Indian blood and during that whole period of time, the Vietnam era, he got really, really um, emotional about the continued mistreatment of Native Americans right across you know, North and South, the whole continent for the time of Columbus to present day. And he'd been working with Time Life Broadcasting, CBS Television, and he resigned and he went on this kind of beat poet, flute playing odyssey in Mexico and he met um, 
a Zagatek woman who, who functioned as some kind of priestess and uh, introduced him to tribal elders and shaman and started talking to him about the calendar system that they had. And he found his way to a place called Santa Maria del Tule, which was associated with a potential historic Quetzalcoatl. Now, I've I found it very interesting uh, over the years. There are some fruitful parallels between Quetzalcoatl and, and King Arthur. Um, you have a whole bunch of mythic material. You have some material that seems to be part of fragments of religious belief that go back who knows how far, but you've also got a historical figure who appears to be anchored to a particular time and somehow he takes all this upon himself. Well, you've got a similar kind of thing, like you've got the Pendragon false and you've got Arthur as the embodiment of it. So you have the Feathered Serpent and you have somebody in the 8th century AD who was the embodiment of this. And he's supposed to have, you know, it is quite a funky image of that feathered serpent concept. He's supposed to have hung out at this place. Now, there's a really famous tree. It, it's, it's a Mexican icon. Now, you can see just from that image that that is one big ass tree. But <laughs> as you kind of step out a little bit further, it gets even more ridiculous because this thing this thing is believed to be somewhere between two and three thousand years old it is considered by some people to be the biggest and the oldest living thing on the face of this earth the, the bottom of the trunk is like 164 feet around the, the weight of the whole thing has been estimated at 550 tons and the trunk of it, I don't know where you can see that bit, but there's a whole row of weird shapes in there that look like animal forms. It's become known as a tree of life. It, it's very, very famous in Mexico. And there are associations with Quetzalcoatl, and Tony Shearer went there and hung out there and, and talked to people and started writing poetry and, and didn't just look at academic sources. He would weave in something that he'd heard from a taxi driver or something that he just picked up from somebody that he met there. But this was all living mythology, living history. It was vital and alive. He started to work on this. And he's met outside just after Woodstock and he started to talk to him a little bit about all of this. Uh, so he's really, really on a, a run now. Uh, he's out there in California, he's in an academic position and he gets, he gets to hear that there's, there's going to be some celebration of the planet on Earth Day. So he thinks, right, he actually manages to work out a situation where his students, you know, his art history students, their exam for their finals is going to be to put on a whole earth festival in which they somehow use art uh, and artistic forms of expression in general to explain ecology and mysticism and a whole bunch of stuff. So, you know, actually on the campus of this university, this whole village of teepees and yurts and geodesic domes spring up and walkways are temporarily renamed the Street of Mysteries and you've got tarot and astrology readings. We, we recognise all this stuff now, this, this kind of thing is, is a template. And, and this is the beginning of, of, of a festival that actually takes root and is still going now. You know, this actually started off at that point. And it, it's absolutely incredible to think that he, he manages to do this. and he's, can you imagine if you had graduated and that had been the form in which you had graduated? However, you know, the, the whole thing is an incredible success. I'm not sure if the photo that I've used here, I tried to find one from 1969. Uh, it looks like it's probably there or thereabouts, but it was decided he should be relieved of his teaching post. 
Uh, so to prevent a general you know, controversy, he just resigns anyway. At this stage, a very interesting chap comes into his life, which is Dane Magellan. Dane was a very multifaceted chap, and you can see him all moody and artistic in that younger shot, uh, trained in music and so on. Child and illness means that he loses a kidney, so he's unable to participate in fun and games like the First World War. He devotes himself to music and creates this experimental uh, atonal music. You can find something on YouTube. Uh, I really like it, it's really interesting. He's, he's a fascinating guy, but he's probably best known as an astrologer. You know, there's, a number, there's, there's a few basic books on, on basic astrological subject matter that are out there and that are very popular and you know, still to this day. But he's also a lot more esoteric in his interest and that title, the planetarisation of consciousness, is a bit of a giveaway for anybody that's familiar with Alice Bailey. He knows Alice Bailey, she actually publishes some of his work and in 1939, the year that Jose was born, he wrote an article for a theosophical magazine uh, called The Artist as Avatar. Uh, there's some really nice artwork as well, I think, uh, by Dane, I think it's quite, quite pleasant. In the artist uh, uh, as Avatar, he basically says that at the end of great cycles, that's when the most important artists incarnate. And their task is to provide a template through their own lives for the next cycle. And Rudyard basically said to uh, Jose that the whole Earth Festival was an act of seventh ray ceremonial magic designed to dissipate negativity and that Jose was one of these next cycle avatars. So that's the kind of nice thing for somebody to come up and tell you, ain't it? you know, that's going to set you up a treat. But now, you know, we move into the level of intensity. Because I mentioned that uh, after this Middle Reaper acid episode, now, as I was looking for a teacher, well, he certainly managed to pick one in 1970 in the form of Jogging Trumper, who was also born in 1939, so he was the same age as those eight. And you think to yourself at that point, they're just, they're just gone 30 years of age. Now, Trumper, uh, there's a book of his material called Crazy Wisdom. He, he pretty much introduced a kind of concept into the general spiritual discourse of the West of the crazy wisdom adept, the person that, that does not exactly play according to the conventional rules of spirituality. He'd already caused a bit of a stir uh, in 1969 when he was 30, when uh, a 16 year old girl who was from a very sort of um, well off high class family married him. He'd actually started to get involved with her. Uh, when she was only 15. This was quite, quite a story at the time. And it establishes the fact that the, the, the chokester doesn't really uh, give a goddamn about anybody's sense of, of conventional spirituality. And people that aren't about with him, uh, you know, he smelled like a chili, drunk like a fish. Uh, he was an alcoholic, he died of cirrhosis of delivery, as we will discover, and as well as having married this 16-year-old uh, girl uh, at sexual relations with a lot of his, of his students. And there are lots of stories of, of, of insanely intense parties that are going on in this situation, but people are also being flipping blasted by this transformative power. As so it's very, very controversial shit. As somebody that's originally saying, yes, you know, I, can, I can handle that, but not, it, it, there's no question there's casualties. Like when I was going through, looking for some pickies, um, I spotted this quote and I thought this was, was, was a pretty cool one, actually, to sum up the jokes. The bad news is you're falling through the air, nothing to hang on to, no parachute. The good news is there is no ground. And Trump is very well known, you know, at the time. He, he, he crops up everywhere. Here he is with, with Allen Ginsberg, here he is uh, with Ram Dass. And one of the concepts that he hits the ground running with 
is something called Dharma Art. He encourages the people to gather around him right from the word go to create a Western art that is based on Buddhist principles. So you're not just copying the forms of Tibetan mandalas and copying the forms of, of, of the various, you know, bodhisattvas and whatever, but you are somehow the contemplative space. And he was very, very um, clear with people about the importance of literally when you start something, the point, the very first point where your pen or your pencil or whatever touches the canvas, that there is something really important in that and the, the level of presence that you bring to it is extremely important. So Hansai gets involved with Trungpa in 1970 and the first major work that he publishes, Mandala, I remember a mate of mine having a copy of this in the 1970s and we used to just you know, sit around and stare at it after we'd had a whole load of splits. This is actually, uh, there's an intro by, by Chokin Trungpa on this one. And a whole bunch of, of really excellent art that Jose was producing um, during that period from the 60s into the early 70s is all um, included in there and gives you a little bit of a, of a sense of what is coming. He has a one-to-one -one with Chogyam Trungpa, you know, a one-to-one -one initiation. This is one of them third eye, third eye type numbers. And almost straight away, he has an extensive interaction with Tony Shearer, who has now written his book of poetry, Lord of the Dawn, and all about Quetzalcoatl and carrying uh, a prophecy uh, of his return, Quetzalcoatl as god of, of the oppressed Native Americans. And I read, you know, I've read this one a few times now. I, I, I really like it. I think it's, if you have the slightest interest in any of these things, it's worth trying to find it and look at it. The Lord of the Dawn is coming, covered with precious feathers. He is coming, carrying a serpent staff. He is coming, the giver of life is coming. The creator of all is coming. And with a definite sense of what is to come with Jose, 13 heavens of decreasing choice, nine hells of increasing doom, and the tree of life should blossom with a fruit never before known in creation, and that fruit should be the new spirit of men. And as a further work, that he produces uh, in 1975, where you start to see an exposition of the calendrical details that lead to the harmonic convergence, because he's quite clear um, there's a whole thing worked out on the basis of uh, when Cortez landed in Mexico and time cycles and so on, that supposedly we're going to conclude on August the 16th, 1987, and then the Lord of the Dawn uh, would return. Now, it's definitely worth saying at this point, and I'll make other points along this line uh, further on, that when it comes to these calculations that underline the Arnold Convergence, uh, there's a lot of issues about this uh, in terms of whether he might have got it massively wrong by anything up to about 100 days. It's nice to see Jeff here. If you look on Jeff Strait's website, Diagnosis 2012, you'll see a big ass article that goes into meticulous detail about all of that stuff if you are you know, sufficiently motivated to, to want to know the exact details. And then I say, same year 75, gets out a book of art criticism transformative vision and it's a lovely little book you know he's still got his art history professor head on that's still the kind of uh, facade that he's shown the world it's a nice little book you know, there's a nice chapter about William Blake in there but he starts talking about these prophecies and in a footnote right at the end he actually mentions and I think this is the first time in any of his works that he specifically mentions 2012 
he talks a bit about the Carla Yoga, he talks about Shambhala, but there's a little mention of 2012 in there. So in 76, 1976, he goes to Palenque for the first time. And this is obviously a place where there's a very famous tomb of uh, the modern Packard, you know, and this is what now become one of the most famous, you know, archaeological artifacts in the world because of the associations that have been brought to it by um, Eric von Daniken and company. Now, I'm not really a um, total nuts and bolts kind of guy myself, but fair play to the ingenuity of the person that got this model together of this thing as a spaceship. <laughs> and there are people who take this really, really flipping seriously. You know, check out this tattoo art, you know. I don't know where you can see that, but the arm on the right looks pretty damn silver to me, you know. You obviously <laughs> are fully committed to the cause when you ink yourself up like that. <laughs> After he's been to Palenque for the first time and, and felt a real connection with Pacal, there's a whole process that lasts about four years where he, he also undergoes a prolonged alcoholic episode. He's with Chogyam Trumpa, who's also a complete alky, but somehow a whole bunch of karma, a whole immense process is going on. His first marriage is wrecked. I'm not quite sure that date of this photo, um, I figure that it's probably somewhere in the late 70s, it's after Timothy Leary's got out of prison obviously, there's Jose with Timothy Leary and Adam Ginsberg. So that contextualises him, you know, I think sometimes if you come to him only through harmonic convergence and everything that happened since in 2012 and his whole identity as Pacal uh, and, and so on, uh, all this, you forget that he is also part of a wider culture and a, a, a wider um, phenomenon. Some of you might remember this. Marilyn Ferguson's query conspiracy. I always thought it was a great book. You know, it came out in, in 1980 and she was a real networker. You know, she liked to bring everybody together and there was an occasion when uh, she met with Jose and she said, um, you've got a bit more time if, if you hang around. There's this guy called Richard Hoagland turning up and, and he's got these fabulous photos with him. So this is, this is 1983, so the whole face on Miles business, whatever we want to make of it, you know, this began in 1976. These, the image was not exactly unknown at that point. A lot of people have been discussing it, but Hoagland had got what he considered to be his best versions of the photos that he'd got. And he was able to show Jose, you know, one-to-one. And it puts him into a bit of a spin. You know, he, he, he's, he's already pretty convinced of, of the existence of extraterrestrial life and other, you know, races of beings that are definitely involved in the big picture here. And this, this does something to his head. And barely a week later, so this is 1983, he's, he's in the parking lot at Los Angeles Airport. And he just suddenly starts writing all this stuff down. He's had this overwhelming idea come to him. And it, it's, it's about this period of time that Tony Shu has talked about, the period of the end of the Nine Hells. And he sees a, a large group of people all lying in a circle with their heads all, all pointed towards the centre where there's a fire burning and, and something about these faces all looking up makes him think of the face on Mars. And he heard the words Earth surrender right. And it was immediately clear that his entire life was somehow present and fulfilled in this vision. This essentially is the origin of the harmonic convergence. So in 84 we get our first what I'd call classic Arguelles style 
book out. This, this, this is old weather, as, as most of us now know it. Uh, a book absolutely full of all this extraordinary artwork and incredibly complex diagrams that explain amazing interlocking ideas like how you somehow bring the I Ching and the Mayan calendar together and how it all looks into different time cycles and, and so on. This is like a, a, a it's revving up for what becomes the Mayan factor uh, a few years later. So clearly he's already been pointed towards 1987 as the period of the end of the Nine Hells and he's looking at Shearer's dates in the middle of August and he's talking to people about it. And in February 1987 there's an uh, unexpected uh, supernova which is, is called 1987A which makes all kinds of pretty pictures in the sky and it's pretty obvious, you know, the people that are gearing up for this big cosmic event are going to feel that this is some kind of very auspicious little, you know, preview that it's going to be a big year. Uh, and the failing that ETs and interdimensionals and whatever are involved is obviously very much enhanced by, you know, the appearance of something like this. And it is intriguing in terms of marrying up all the time cycles and working out the what and the wherefore that there was a big Tibetan Kalashakra cycle uh, which actually came to an end on 28th of February that year. 87 again on Jeff's site and John Major Jenkins' book suggests what you'll find an awful lot about all of this. And then, you know, barely a month later, April the 4th, 1987, Chodim Trumpa dies of cirrhosis of the liver and a mere 12 days later the mind factor is published. So it, it feels to me like it, it, there's a really fundamental unity between uh, Arguella's connection with Trumpa and the Tibetan energies, the Tibetan teaching and the, the manifesting of his deeper columns if you like in terms of his work with the mind culture, the mind imagery. So this is this is you know full of all these incredible diagrams where you've got periods of world history, the back terms mapped out, they've got particular characteristics, particular flavours, and how the beginnings of this idea, this critique, if you like, of Western civilization that we are using uh, a distorted time cycle, not a natural time cycle, and the the whole system that we're using, uh, because it's not natural, because it's distorted, is literally distorting our very psyches, our form of society, our form of culture, um, that we have this idea that time is money, but there's another more natural way of looking at things that says time is art. And you know, here's how the different mind calendar glyphs map out all these different bits of the human body and so on and so forth. We've probably seen things like this, uh, they're all over the show. And it finally comes to pass, and, and this, this is a real triumph because it's pre-internet. You know, in terms of, of, of getting the word out, the means to do that were immeasurably different in far off 1987 to what they are now. But the interesting thing is that he had broken through into the wider media that American TV news channels, uh, some of the major newspapers, uh, you know, newspapers in this country were carrying the story about this big event. And the idea really was basically go to any sacred site in the world, try and just go to as many of them as possible and be there for sunrise on the bottom the 16th, you know, that's the, the central time. But it essentially, you know, uh, uh, it's predicated by the old complex calendrics that, that Tony Shearer has worked out, but it is not, it is kind of intriguing that it, when we call it the New Age Woodstock, and they only started calling that, it, that about a week beforehand, in, in, I think one of the newspapers used that term, that it's covering the same period of time, you know, the same days in August that Woodstock had back in, in 1969. And it wasn't a case of do a particular thing. 
it was like whatever seems appropriate. Just tune in, just be reverent towards the place that you're at and simply being there and having that, that power of communion, knowing that there are people at all these other places all around the world at the same time. This was the first time that anything on that level of the game uh, had ever been done. So, of course, that happens in Glasgow, you know, you know, oh, my God, what black and white photo, that's pretty miserable, isn't it? <laughs> if it weren't for the clothes, it could be, it could be 1887, couldn't it? Thank <laughs> heavens for a chap called Martin Tracy, whose photography site I found, who managed to get a couple of shots <coughs> of the sunrise from the tour on that day. Surprising um, how little, actually, uh, stuff that you can find on Google image search of that period of time. Now, Kevin Redpath, who many of you I'm sure will know in Glastonbury, he, he videoed all of the, you know, a lot of the harmonic convergence celebrations in Glastonbury over a period of time. And there was a video that he had out, uh, oh, was, oh, ages ago, 15 years ago. Uh, I don't know what he's done with it. I don't know if it ever found its way into DVD format, but there is a record of it all. And the sense is, you know, uh, if you talk to people that were around then, that this was, was a fairly big moment for, for Glastonbury in terms of its sense of its status and its function and what's going on, and that the game is afoot. And, you know, come on, you know, we can, we can really do something here. We can really make things happen. And Glastonbury celebrations do find their way into, that's the Guardian, actually, and, and there's Robert Cohn, and it's got to be said, you know, Tony Shearer didn't mind too much that Jose uh, was fronting this thing that essentially came um, from his uh, ideas, but, but Robert Cohn, it has to be said, uh, was a little bit more conflicted about Jose because Robert, and I've talked a lot about his work in, in my Avalonia New York, Robert had been on this thing as well, from a lot longer than Jose had been on it. He'd been, he'd been out to Ortula in 1967. He'd actually buried some crystal thing uh, in the vicinity of the tree with a sense that it was, he met Tony Shearer, he'd gone into a whole bunch of stuff with him. This was gonna activate uh, at, at sunrise on, on August the 16th, 1987. He'd got a whole global work, this whole stuff that we see um, about the global chakra sites, you know, this was all part of it. I, I, I saw there was a post, somebody put it on, I could turn up on my Facebook news feed today and I looked at it, it was about global chakras and there was an actual diagram by Robert Cohn, no mention of his name anywhere. And then there was a little link to another site which was supposedly the source and I went on to that and the same thing again and a diagram by Robert Kuhn, the Global Shepherd so it's no mention of his name and then onto another, and then that linked into another site and no credit for it at all. Uh, and I'm always quite clear in giving Robert the, the credit for that. He was the person that was essentially the centre of gravity of the harmonic convergence uh, celebrations in Glastonbury in 1987 and, and there was um, one nice little event, part of all of that was uh, in Glastonbury Abbey, uh, around the older of, of the fish ponds. There's a bunch of people sitting in a circle all the way around the whole thing with Robert, and they're all tuning into whatever. He had the sense of there were two uh, rainbow serpents uh, that had been activated. Quetzalcoatl was one of them, and there was a kind of female rainbow serpent as well. Uh, Robert's an amazing man, amazing visionary, and he can't be left out of this. Uh, his sense, just like with Tony Shearer, uh, was that these original dates have come out of the Aztec calendar system, and that there isn't implied a part two in this. You know, when it comes to what leads on to 2012, uh, you know, they diverge from this, uh, and obviously. You know, there are all these kind of controversies as to the date and if I want to convert it anyway. So after this happens, uh, you know, the media do actually run with it for a while. There was a, a, a bit of a stock market crash towards the end of 1987 and, and newspapers in America actually ran articles on is this something to do with the harmonic convergence that weren't piss takes. They were kind of almost serious about it, you know, what the hell's going on here. And Jose recognised that he needed to communicate something about all this 
to the younger generation and to um, a broader audience of people perhaps. And this is where this far shorter work, Surface of the Zavoy, come in. And there's, you know, I mentioned that there's, there's a, a background of, of some pretty heavy stuff, death and rebirth, he had paratyphoid and nearly died. There have been other episodes where he'd been in car crashes and so on, but this is the real hardcore one that calls to mind what happened to Robert Anna Wilson with his daughter in Cosmic Trigger. Because his son Josh, who had been born, you know, just before, just before the moon landing in Woodstock, uh, was killed in a car crash shortly after the Harmonic Convergence while he was uh, starting to write this book. And so this book kind of comes out of it uh, in many respects. And I think of all those, those books, if there was one book that I would recommend to a wider audience, it's probably this one. Uh, the sense that you, know, you don't have to be uh, deeply into the intricacies of the visionary system that he has created on the basis of the mind calendar to, to get the vibe of this. The sense is that you know we all have uh, a kind of fourth dimensional light body that is you know connected to source and is running uh, according to natural law and uh, we can clear the static in that and get fully engaged with it by uh, engaging with our, our sense of our own unique natural time. Now in my Abalone Neal uh, I write about the effect that it had on me and you know I've given lectures on synchronicity and how to create synchronicity in your own life and so on for the Positive Living Group uh, uh, mm. and talked a lot about this in Abalone Neal. I, I didn't feel the inspiration that I got from this book made it necessary for me to fully engage with the intricacies of the system. It stimulated me because I had so much data of my own because I'm an obsessive diary keeper and I keep note of my anniversaries and I play games with time anyway, that this was sufficient to actually set me off. Uh, and it set me off big time and it's a book that I, I love uh, to come back and read you know, periodically over the last 25 years or so, I don't know, I must have read it about nearly 10 times I would imagine. It's the kind of book you can read in a day, it's not a complicated book. The next stage of the game really is when, in 1992, you know, Jose's worked out that on the way up to 2012, which is the end of a, a huge um, time period in the mind calendar, that it's the beginning of a whole new world when, you know, to use Robert Allen Wilson's terminology, we pull the cosmic trigger. There was a period where there's a bit of fine tuning, if you like, and this began in 1992. And as I comes up with this thing called Dream Spell, which is his kind of uh, Mayan calendar, do it yourself oracle, if you like. I'm, I'm sure a number of you have got have had these over the years and maybe still got them used. And, you know, I, I certainly did for a while and it is an incredible system, it is a triumph of a visionary genius, I'm not in any doubt at all about that, but there's also no doubt about the fact that there is tremendous controversy as to whether you can really call this uh, an authentic Mayan calendar rather than a version of the Mayan calendar, you know, produced by a visionary genius. And again, um, people like John Major Jenkins and Jeff here, the intricacies of all of that uh, are fully covered. You know, one of the things that comes out of this um, is of course this idea of the day out, day out of time, which is an absolute, it's a beautiful idea that there is a kind of a day between years where essentially you, you step out of consensus reality and you return to you know, inspiration and you, you return to source and you. But if we're looking at the calendar systems of the living Maya that there are tribes in, I think in Honduras and so on, that have been using the calendar all the way through there are some significant differences here, but does that mean you can't get a result out of this? 
You know, if the, if the harmonic convergence was a, a hundred days out in its calculations, does that mean, does that somehow invalidate the epic nature of it? No, it doesn't, but I think it's important, it's really important to bear these things in mind. Now, we see in this little image here, um, this red circle with the three dots, the three circles in it. And this brings in uh, a very, very important influence in the latter part of Arquelli's life, which is Nicholas Rurik, the mystical Russian painter and explorer. An amazing man, and it's kind of intriguing the way my lectures and so on are kind of shaken up this year because um, 1997 was the 50th anniversary of, of Rurik's death and I thought that somebody would probably do a presentation on Rurik in Glastonbury. When it became obvious that no one was going to, I thought, oh well, I guess I'm going to have to do it. Uh, and I did. And a whole bunch of stuff came out of that. And I was talking to a few people about it. I was talking to Samuel about it, and then I realised that this year, the anniversary of his death, again, falls on one of the days that the Positive Living Group meets. So later on this year, I'm going to be doing my presentation on Rurik again, uh, which is quite intriguing. Rurik, somebody who journeyed on a quest for Shambhala, which is you know, a mystical state of consciousness and also supposedly a physical location that slips in and out of reality, if you're lucky. It's at the very heart of the mysticism of Tibetan Buddhism. And you know, it's, it's the warrior teaching of Shambhara, if you like, is also very much at the heart of what Chokya and Trumpa is all about. And in the course of, of, of Rurik's journeys, you know, across Central Asia in the 1920s and so on. He, this is the, the, the warrior king, Shambhala, who's, who's again a kind of, you can place him alongside Quetzalcoatl and you can place him alongside King Arthur. There are a certain amount of similarities uh, in terms of what's felt about and the fact that this is a, a time for him to make the return. But Rurik, as a mystical artist, had a sense that art was extremely important. You know, it's, it's not just serving a decorative function, it's actually, uh, you know, an, an emotional glue that holds a society together and through which, you know, the conduit of inspiration uh, and can't be separated from religion, you know, a, a true a true religious expression of consciousness is inevitably going to also bring in a certain creativity, a certain expression, and a certain type of culture. And that when you've got um, great works of art, where you've got cathedrals and all the rest of it, they should be recognised. And just like you've got, you know, a Red Cross organisation that on a battlefield, if you hoist a Red Cross. You know, if somebody is, they're going to stop shooting at you. Uh, doesn't always happen. It didn't exactly happen when my father got wounded uh, in the Battle of Kohima and the Japanese kept on shooting at him, even though a Red Cross had been raised over his stretcher. But there you are. The idea is pretty good. The idea is pretty good. And the amazing thing about Rurik is uh, he was pretty highly connected, he was a figure of great culture. He actually got uh, a bunch of international statesmen and so on um, under uh, the umbrella of the United States President in 1935 to sign this International Peace Pact. And, and the image that went with it, an image that he found in his travels that he felt was appropriate, was this, um, the three red dots in the red circle. Uh, so this thing became a tremendous ideal. Uh, in the Second World War, you know, Rurik's come from Russia. Um, the whole, you know, the Nazis went out of their way um, to trash churches and, and destroy, you know, priceless icons and the kind of stuff that, that Rurik really hoped would somehow be um, preserved. But the ideal remains. Um, you know, I'm not going to say too much about Rurik's life and work because I have plenty to say on that later on in the year. 
But our Gwenis kind of picks up the ball and runs with it because he realises that they are profoundly all on the same page together. And there comes a certain point where pretty much everything that Jose does also carries this image and the idea of, of art for pace, you know, living art for pace and, and the time and creativity and pace and a natural cycle are all really one and the same thing. And if you are living according to the processes, that harmony is, is pretty much inevitable. And the full circle, you know, the full circle comes in 2002. Uh, and you can't really, you haven't got a full kind of visual context in this picture, but he's back on top of the pyramid of Teotihuacan where he's had his initial mystical awakening at the age of 14. And he's been recognised by a whole bunch of, of Mayan elders and so on and so forth and, and kind of you know, given a ceremony type and all the rest of it. We reached a very strange like, level of the game where there were you know, genuine Mayan elders who didn't know necessarily a, a huge amount about their own calendar system and were starting to turn to people as I say as the experts in all this and it all began to turn a little bit inside out. But one way or another, it's an incredible journey. It's an incredible acknowledgement. Now, to my own way of thinking, um, I followed them today through Earth Ascending, through the Mind Factor, and I could just stare at all these diagrams, and I, 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 I think I understood them. But the terminology just became ever more dense. You know, there's some fantastic late works. Time and the Technosphere that was inspired by, by 9-11 is an amazing work. But the stuff gets more and more involved and, and more and more, um, for me, disconnected from my reality. I found that I simply could only follow him so far. And it is, you know, it's a strange thing that he, and also Terence McKenna, who was the other great prophet of 2012, that neither of them actually lived to see 2012. You know, they both died before then. That's, that's a, a mysterious thing. But I've made use of this quote in Avalonian Eon, you know, who owns your time, owns your mind. Own your own time and know your own mind. You know, there, there, there is a whole bunch of stuff, uh, and I, I, I do, not really going to say too much about it tonight, I do go into it in Avalon in New York. The idea, you know, you hear it almost as a, as a cliche about culture, time, is money. You know, the, the, the whole system of time that we work by seems to have this built in uh, sense of disc ease and acceleration which makes us constantly you know never um at pace and always having to be rushing around doing things in our whole society the whole industrial revolution and all the rest of it just accelerated and intensified that the planet gets abused and all the rest of it i say you know put forward a time reform program submitted it to the united nations and the rest of it that we should change over um, to the mind cannon. Now I never at any stage thought that there was the slightest bleeding chance of any such thing ever occurring in the United Nations just saying, all right like America, all right like Russia, you know, let's just completely change our time scale. And I doubt however much you might have wanted it to, I doubt those I did either, but it's important to have an ongoing critique of, of something that is taken so much for granted. You know, we're, we've all got a tremendous amount of, of multiple cycles running through our lives that have all kinds of effects on us. And the more we become conscious of that which is, is, is our own, then the more that strange, you know, spell of the consensus ceases to you know have that binding power for us and it and it is quite obviously through art and so on that, that this can occur now 
how does an influence, an inspiration that comes from somebody like Jose who seems to just be so connected up with the Mayan calendar, how, how does that impact on, on somebody like me that's not giving over completely to wanting to know the exact what is today's day sign and what does that mean and how does that fit in with so on and so forth. How, the tale that I'm telling you tonight, you know, how, what kind of effect can that have on any of us now? So the mysterious timing that I'm getting to do, you know, I was just invited to do this one. Uh, I wasn't expecting necessarily towards the end of the year to do it. I've got Rory coming up. Next year in Glastonbury, um, I'm being set up with a bit of a double whammy that might just be the biggest epic that I've ever manifested in all of my life and might land pretty strongly in Glastonbury. For a few years, I've been mindful of the classical concerts that Michael Evers puts on in Glastonbury Abbey and I've been mindful of the fact that he's never used the classic British pastoral music of the first generation of the last century, Rayford Williams, Lark Ascending, all this kind of stuff. The material that evokes the lost generation of the First World War but also evokes a far deeper sense of the landscape and the ancestors and so forth. And for a few years while we've been in this centenary of the Great War, I've been trying to put forward the idea that wouldn't it be great to have a commemorative concert over in the Abbey with all of that music that somehow, you know, honoured that generation, but also the first generation of the Avalonians, you know, these characters, Wells and Judah Pole, Frederick Blyball, that first generation, Alex Buckton, and various people uh, were interested, but we've now got to the point, um, very much with the aid of our recent mayor, John Cousins, um, next year, Michael Edis is having a classical concert, and he's agreed that he will leave the stage, the sound system, the sound crew, everybody in place uh, in order for us to do whatever we want. So it's like the task and the apprentice now, I've just got to find an orchestra and one or two other little things. <laughs> and the idea is that evening ends with a uh, choir singing Jerusalem. I think I'm going to have to do in the spirit of up and about, and I'm hoping it's going to be the Alemanian Free State Choir. Running simultaneously behind that for a week leading in is going to be a free-floating William Blake Festival. Uh, there'll be people popping up reciting Blake poetry around the town. We'll have a conference probably over the road in the June pay and we've already hired out the town hall. Uh, and the idea is that we'll get some of the psychedelic musos around and we'll have an epic evening where we've got Blake artwork projected everywhere. We've got people singing and performing Blake poems and songs, and there'll be a few, you know, uh, spacey synth and 10 minute guitar solos thrown into all of that. So that's a real, that's the 60s, that's 60s spirit, spirit of that, 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 that timeline. And there's also the first generation you know, the beginning of the Avalonians, beginning of the 20th century, all of that running in together, all of that running into both things climaxing with this performance of Jerusalem and a huge consideration of what the hell does that mean and what is it all about. Now, basically, in the back of my mind as the meta perspective for what the hell am I doing is everything that I've just told you tonight and also everything that I'll be talking about when I give the Nicholas Ruhr lecture. It, this is an example of how you run with that general emotional tone, you run with that inspiration, and you manifest it through the raw material of where you live, what time of your life it is, what the time of the culture is, everything. You know, that is what I take harmonic convergence to me. You know, and, and that is, that is the, the success, the triumph of somebody like Jose. The, you know, I, I can take that and I can take that level of inspiration uh, uh, from him and I can use that raw material. So I hope that what I've conveyed to you in some way tonight 
indicates the fact that you know some of these great mystical artists, some of these great mystical figures, you don't have to completely buy into the intricate details of whatever their system of thought is. If you take the broad context of their life and times and the feeling time that's associated with them, then that can be a tremendous inspiration. It's like, how can I ironically converge my own life? You know, our, look at all the inspiration of in the 60s, Martin Luther King in the Vietnam protest and so on, and the whole Earth Festival and the people that he met and, uh, 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 and the meetings with Chuck and Trumper. I really understand that because when I was writing my first book, Mysterio Martorius, which was all about, um, Arth you know, Glastonbury, Arthurian Grail studies, I was uh, going out to Germany and having Darshan with Mother Mira quite a lot during that period of time. There were, there were a few years in the middle of writing Mysterio Martorius. I think I had two years on the trot, I had about 12 Darshans in a year each year with Mother Mira. And, and I was coming back completely and utterly blasted and just like after Jose's had a one-to-one -one with Chuck M. Trump and he, then he meets Tony Shearer and he goes straight into that. So I was coming back from our era and just completely engaging in Glastonbury, the Grail, Gothic Cathedrals. The failing of it, the time that was with it was completely enlivened by that and it cannot be separated from it which is why you know Mysterio Martorius I've got a little dedication to Mother Mira living Grail in all of that. This is the kind of thing that's going on and if we're aware of that and we speak the language of it and we understand the nuances of it then we can cultivate the same things in ourselves, the same inspirations and, and spread that forth because you know, anyone that's studied 2012 knows that it's not you know, necessarily something that there's, it was that moment, 21st December 2012, that's it. It's an enormous great process and clearly you know, all right, space drivers never turned up, but what the hell's happened to the world since 2012? It's completely an utterly barking man crazy. So it's up to, it's up to the, those that have got, you know, the understanding, the vision, that have got the sense of continuity, that have latched onto the history and what all this is all about, to carry it forward. We've all got responsibility in this. So on that thought, I leave it there and I say, yay to you all, yay. I've got a few copies of our Lonely Neil here, they're only seven on Thanks for stuff about us, like. Yeah, yeah. All right, yeah. Thanks so much, Paul.